Thank you for the invitation to speak at this meeting. My name is Stephen from Singapore, and the title of my talk today is Percutaneous Venous Arterialization an Emerging Treatment for No Option Critical Limb Ischemia. These are my disclosures. There are two basic problems in critical limb ischemia. One is that of a transmission failure due to big artery disease, resulting in difficult balloon passage, recoil, dissection, and restenosis. Second issue is that of distribution failure due to small artery disease between arteries in the plantar arch and metatarsal and digital vessels. This leads to the scenario of no outflow or the desert foot. In the recent paper of about 239 patients treated in the dedicated limb salvage unit, the incidence of no option critical limb ischemia was about 25%. Clearly, the, the outcomes for this group was, was significantly worse in terms of limb salvage, amputation and mortality. Percutaneous DVA with the lymph flow device involves an arterial and venous catheter, a forward for cutting valvulotome, and several stent grafts to perform the DVA. A patient with critical limb ischemia and desert foot can be perfused initially with a retrograde venous excess with a four French catheter, passage of the four French catheter into the vein to the area of the crossing point, advancing a six French compatible catheter down to the area of the crossing point, orientation of both of them crossing of the artery to the vein performed with a crossing needle and snaring of, a, of an O14Y with the venous snare catheter, getting through and through wire excess, balloon dilatation, and subsequent implantation of several stent grafts after the use of a forward cutting valvulotome to lyse the valves, resulting in arterialized blood flow entering the deep venous circuit. A proprietary self-expanding tapered covered stent is used to, to control the amount of shunting into the vein. The lymph flow clinical program is robust and involves US sites as well as old US sites. The data that we have so far are from the ALPS registry as well as the PROMISE-1 early visibility study. Both the PROMISE Early Feasibility Study in the US as well as the ARPS International Registry involved patients who were diabetic and with Rutherford 6 wounds. The amputation-free survival at 12 months was very similar at 70% and wound healing ranged between 75 to 86%. Looking at the 24-month results of the PROMISE 1 and the ARPS Registry, the amputation-free survival held steady at 67% in the ARPS Registry. The 24 months of the PROMISE 1 Registry were presented at VIVA 2021. Looking at the wound healing results, you can see that the trajectory suggests a continued wound healing beyond 12 months. Very similar pattern was seen in the ALPS registry with complete wound healing of 73% at 24 months. These are some case examples. This is a patient with diabetes and three prior failed interventions in six months with severe rest pain and a desert foot. And after the DVA, was, and six months later, we were able to get the salvage of a functional foot, although with several toe amputations and a high TCPO2. Rest pain had resolved as well. Reinterventions were necessary to maintain patency and prevent thrombosis. But one can clearly see, with the use of negative pressure therapy in the later part of the wound care and standard wound care subsequently, we were able to preserve the foot. The improvement of perfusion in this same patient was impressive, with a TCPO2 of 81 and 73 at 18 months. 18 months after DVA, we were able to prevent amputation and preserve ambulatory status of this patient with wound healing. Now, what are the unanswered questions in percutaneous DVA? With the evidence that we have on hand, it seems to suggest that percutaneous DVA is a viable option. However, there are several unanswered questions. Firstly, how we define no option critical limb ischemia, where and how much to shunt, the need for partial or full arterialization, where, when, and how, post procedural wound care, surveillance and re intervention, and cost effectiveness. Let's first discuss how we define no option critical limb ischemia. I think it's important for us to discuss how we define NOP CLTI. Certainly, there can be a variation between individual interventionists and surgeons, what that means. 
In the PROMISE-1 and PROMISE-2 US studies on the lymph flow device, all of these patients had their angiograms verified by the independent group of skilled vascular surgeons and interventionists to determine the no-option status together with information on both the wound and the angiograms after failed conventional intervention. Perhaps there are some new ways that we can predict who would become a no-option patient looking at the calcification of plain x-rays. Roberto Ferrazzi and colleagues analyzed 200 over patients looking at the outcome of complete wound healing stratified by the severity of medial calcary calcification and seen on plain x-rays. They showed that patients with severe medial artery calcification had severe and bad wound healing. Perhaps moderate to severe medial artery calcification should be considered for early deep venous arterialization. I'll now like to discuss some important concepts we've learned over the years. It is important to have appropriate shunting to avoid a steel phenomenon. There are several factors that affect the amount of shunting that goes through a DVA circuit. First and foremost, there's the inflow pressure, the arterial outflow resistance, and the venous outflow resistance. Modifiable factors include the distance between the large, the last large arterial collateral and the crossover point, and the diameter of the shunt. In a scenario where there's severe tibial vessel disease, the amount of shunting increases due to the increase in arterial outflow resistance. In the same scenario where the arterial outflow resistance is higher, prox more proximal shunting is to be avoided for the fear of increasing the amount of shunting that goes through the DVA circuit. In this scenario, a more distal crossover point to reduce the amount of shunting is important to prevent steel phenomenon. However, a more distal crossing point also leads to potential source of re-stenosis due to the lack of, a, of total lesion coverage in the proximal tibial vessel. It is also important to choose a crossover point that's below the largest collateral. Some physicians have performed off-the-shelf DVA with a 5mm via band. In this case, a 5mm via band is implanted into a 3mm tube and one can clearly see the severe amount of graft infolding, which may lead to thrombosis. Angiographically, the size mismatch is pretty clear. An increase in the crossing stent from a 3.5 mm diameter to a 5 mm diameter represents a fourfold increase in the amount of shunting for the same shunting location. The lymph flow slant is a tapered graft from 3.5 mm to 5 mm that prevents excessive amount of shunting. It is also important to treat inflow adequately. In this case, a well placed DVA circuit may potentially steal blood from existing vessels in the presence of a re-stenosis in the proximal vessel. Another concept that we have to discuss is that of partial versus full arterialization. Partial arterialization occurs when there's insufficient flow and pressurization of the forefoot. Full arterialization involves getting the blood towards the metatarsal veins and the digital veins. Now, why is flow and pressurization of the plantar arch as seen in full arterialization important? Some of the early scientific work done by Professor Sachajima showed that it is absolutely essential for the retrograde arterial blood to reach a venue that's 30 micrometers in size to allow for the oxygen diffusion into the tissues. Some key essential steps are required in order to achieve full arterialization. First and foremost, we have to ensure good inflow without excessive shunting by the use of a tapered stent. Secondly, we have to connect the deep plantar venous arch through the lateral plantar vein. Thirdly, we have to lyse the valves without trauma using a forward cutting valvular tome. To ensure adequate pressurization of the plantar venous arch, ligation of the great saphenous vein or the middle marginal veins, embolization of the perforator veins, and simple measures like hanging your foot down and getting the patient to walk and, and time is, is required to ensure pressurization of the venous arch. As shown in this picture here, good inflow with the absence of disease in the proximal vessels as well as appropriate amount of shunting with a tapered stand to prevent steel phenomenon. With the connection of the lateral plantar vein, we can see in this case Deep tissue perfusion can occur with pressurization, giving a high TCPO2 and good clinical result in wound healing.
Distal to the covered stand, a forward for cutting valve lutum is required to lyse the valves to ensure adequate pressurization of the deep venous arch. This can be achieved atraumatically using a forward cutting valve lutum as seen in this cadaveric angioscope. Other measures include ligation of the great saphenous vein or embolization if appropriate. In this case, with great saphenous vein ligation, forward flow to the Lajas plexus of veins is visualized. Flow and pressurization is improved one month after great saphenous vein ligation as seen in this case. The presence of perforators may actually prevent the pressurization and forward flow of contrast. After embolization of these perforators, improved forward flow and pressurization is seen. Using a combination of these techniques, a case like that, where pre-DVA shows a desert foot, plant elective coiling of perforators is performed and one can already start to see the presence of improved forward flow. Two months after coiling, one can already start to see improved forward flow and flow through the Lajas plexus of veins. By undertaking all these steps, we can already start to see an improved forward perfusion and pressurization, giving a good clinical result. We now like to discuss how we perform surveillance. We did an analysis of the duplex surveillance performed in 22 patients with a total number of volume flow measurements of 623. An average number of 25 volume flow measurements were performed per patient. These patients were analyzed at five points, one above the inflow, one in each the upper, middle and lower thirds of the covered stent, and one in the outflow. Our analysis showed that a volume flow value of less than 195 milliliters per minute the mid portion of the stent graph was predicted for failure within the first three months. An example of surveillance was this particular patient that had the limb flow performed on the 1st of June with a post procedural volume flow measurement of 387. Two and a half months after the index procedure, the volume flow measurement had dropped to 72 milliliters per minute. An angiogram revealed stenosis distal to the stent graph which was summarily treated with a drug-coated balloon and improved flow. Post-procedural volume flow measurements subsequently went up from 72 milliliters per minute to 285 milliliters per minute. Some new data has emerged to help us decide if percutaneous DVA is cost-effective. Dr. Speech and colleagues analyzed the cost-effectiveness of percutaneous DVA using the lymph flow device in the 30 patients that were recruited in the US Promise 1 study. The metric for cost effectiveness was the incremental cost effectiveness ratio per quality adjusted life years. According to the American Heart Association, the interventions are deemed cost effectiveness for values of 150,000 per QA per, per quality adjusted life years and were considered high value for those amounts less than $50,000. The endpoints analyzed were survival, major amputation, wound care, and re-interventions. And data sources were the Promise 1 12-month data, historical controls were identified through meta-analysis, Medicare cost analysis, and other published data. This recent study looked at the amputation-free survival in patients with no option critical limb ischemia. The meta-analysis average was 33%, as compared to the 12-month AFS rate of 69.7% in the PROMISE-1 data. Cost-effectiveness of percutaneous DVA with the lymph flow device was analyzed in different clinical scenarios. For example, those where no mortality benefit was observed, higher mortality, lower amputation-free survival, lower proportion of wound healing, and increased number of interventions. Despite the different clinical scenarios, percutaneous DVA was still considered high value. In summary, percutaneous DVA with the lymph flow device is a promising option to treat no option critical limb ischemia with desert foot in complex patients, allowing limb preservation and wound healing. A dedicated kit with a crossing device, tapered stent and valvulatum 
in combination with a standardized procedure ensures appropriate shunting as compared to several off-the-shelf devices. We continue to learn how to optimize our technique and post-procedural care. It is important to discuss problems and solutions within a structured clinical trial. Thank you very much for your attention.